Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Your attention, please. This is your last call. Please be seated. The show is about to begin. There's the rim shot for James. All right. Praise the Lord. There you go. That's what I like to hear. All the time. All right. Good morning. I, I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, I'm really excited. For some reason, I'm nervous right now. I don't know why. Probably. Uh, either that or maybe the fact that I'm filling in today for for James and I haven't sat behind a drum set in over a year. Uh, so, I don't know. I get performing anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm really excited today. God is good. It's a beautiful day. I want to share something with you very quick before I yield the podium to Tammy. Uh, you know, the Olympics are going on right now. And yesterday was a very big day for my homeland of Puerto Rico. Uh, for the first time in the entire history that we have sent the team to represent us, we won a gold medal. And it was... <laughs> and it was the first time that a female athlete has won a medal ever from our delegation. And she won the gold medal in tennis, beating the number two in the world. It's a 22-year-old girl that is ranked 34, has only played in two Grand Slam tournaments ever, and has only won one. She was able to keep her composure and cool all the way through the tournament and they started creating all these hashtags trending on Twitter like Pika Power because that's what they were calling her Pika and all that stuff. But there was one thing that was resonating mostly above everything. And everybody was saying the same thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. Yeah. This girl <coughs> through her talents by playing this sport, she was able to bring my entire country together as one. I was reading in the, in the press that all the streets yesterday were empty because everybody was gathered somewhere watching this match. It was very important because right now they're going through all this problems, the economic crisis and all that uh, but she was able to get everybody to forget everything that was going on. At least she gave them some sort of hope through that. And through the whole thing, she said, I am not doing this for me. I am doing this for my country because this is for them. We really need this. And I was thinking about that this morning. And the thing that kept coming to my mind was how everybody was saying the same thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it doesn't mean that she won because God didn't want the other girl to win. She trusted God to give her peace, to be able to keep her composure through the whole thing, not let any mistakes that she might have made get to her and take her off her game. And that's how we should be. Life is going to throw things at us. And they're, it's going to try to steer us away from the path that we're walking. The devil is going to do the same thing. But when we sit and we get to that uh, fork in the road, as Stan mentioned the other day, we pray and we remind ourselves, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. So we're here because we are being, we've been given a mandate, and that is to go out and make disciples of the world, preach the gospel, share with people the good news of Jesus Christ, 
But before we do that, we come in here to be fed, to be instructed, to be trained, to be strengthened. And then when we go out, we say to ourselves, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever the world throws at you, whatever the devil throws at you, you know, that you can take that tennis racket and swing it back. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Amen. Now Tammy has something to share. And I promised her I was going to stand next to her. So. <laughs> um, I didn't come up with any notes. The Lord said, trust him. So pray that I'm able to give it to you like he gave it to me yesterday while I was mowing. As I was mowing, the Lord was talking to me, and I feel like I need to share it, if only for myself, to hear it out loud. Um, I understand we're all in different places in our revelation, so if what I'm saying doesn't make sense to you, that's okay. And if you already get this, and you're like, oh, I got that a long time ago, that's okay too. <clears throat> and as I talked about last week, I've been going through a lot of crap, for a lack of a better word, um, with my son and, and the situation at my home. And I was, as I was mowing, you know, think, life happens, right? And people will say, you know, that God's teaching them a lesson. I don't, I don't like that term because God isn't causing it. And it's, it, to me, that sounds like God's out to get you, and he's not out to get any of us. Right. But because life happens, I believe God is talking to us all the time if we just tune in and listen to him. And the things that we are experiencing, he can use those to talk to us and teach us more about who he is, which in turn is who we are. And if we'll listen... We'll be able to get through those situations and at the same time the people in our lives will be ministered to because we're being more like Christ right. to me uh, in this church we have a lot we know a lot to me revelation is when it goes from here to here you know when you've received a healing uh, a, something miraculous you know that you know that you know you know you experienced it to me that is revelation nobody is ever ever going to change your mind or take that away from you and that's what I had happen to me yesterday I not a healing but you know I we all know who we know, we all know grace is a person but grace is also the unmerited, undeserved favor of God that we get. And as I was mowing, you know, I'm, I'm feeling sorry for myself, you know. Uh, my son, I'm going to be telling you some things <laughs> that maybe you don't want to hear, but he was only supposed to stay with us for three months to get a leg up, to save some money to get a new place because they lost the place they were staying at before. And in about two weeks, he will have been staying with us for two years. He steals from us. He breaks things because he's borrowed them and he hasn't asked. He has his own room that would put an episode of hoarders to shame. He has a bathroom off of that room and a door off of that room to go and come as he pleases and he goes and comes at all hours and days of the, I mean, at hours of the night. And he comes into our home, which is fine, to shower and whatever, but, you know, he helps himself to groceries and things that we set up ground rules, but yet he doesn't follow any of them. I say all that, and I told you last week, I spoke scriptures that I deserve as a child of God and I was able to minister to him a little bit. I read him all those scriptures, and he looked at me, and he said, but what does that mean, Mom? And I said, Christ didn't just die for you on the cross. I mean, that's not just salvation. Everything. You're entitled to peace. You're in, you know, the Bible says that you will be mighty. You will be blessed. 
you are highly favored. So I was able to minister a little bit, whether he gets it or not. But like I said, I was out mowing, feeling sorry for myself because I'm thinking how I feel the devil has beat me up about what a lousy mother I've been because, you know, uh, raise up a child and how he should go. And I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? He's not getting this. Why is he not getting out? You know, and then at the same time feeling sorry because he's breaking my stuff and I can't find my stuff and a lot of Dan's things. And, and so the Lord spoke to me and he reminded me the story of the prodigal son. And I thought, he's not a prodigal son. I didn't give him any inheritance, you know. Yes, he's my son. But God started to minister to me through that. This... When, when your children are old enough to go out on their own, you have, hopefully and probably, because you're a child of God, you're blessed. You've acquired a few things. You have some things maybe to enjoy in retirement, things to make your life easier, uh, things that you've worked hard for. And so this young man went to his father and said, I want my inheritance. I'm sure there was probably some fighting you know, I mean, it, it's a short story in the Bible, but there was probably a lot that led up to that. That young man probably was causing so much trouble that the dad said, here, here's your stuff, go. And he went. And I'm sure that the father probably heard back how he lost his ride, how he squandered his money, how he was breaking the things that he had given him. And having been in that situation it makes you angry. Because those are things you worked hard for. And I think it makes it more painful that it's family that does this to you because you expect more from them. They know you. You know, if a, st a stranger comes and steals, breaks into your home and steals your things, yes, that makes you angry, but you can sort of understand. They don't know you. They don't have any respect for you. They don't. It's different with family. It hurts deeper. And so I'm sure this father was hurt by what his son had done. And this reminds me also of my grandfather had hundreds of acres. And all of his sons bought what probably would have been eventually some of their inheritance. But they bought it so that they could start their own families and have farms. And one of my uncles, I believe he was the oldest, in trying to save his marriage, he was squandering his money, living beyond his means. He filed bankruptcy. And I remember that my grandfather, and then he moved out of state, but my grandfather bought all of his land and that home and took back possession of that part of the bankruptcy. But when my, father, or my grandfather died, he got his stuff back. All of it. And I believe that in the story of the prodigal son, as hurt as that father was, that all those things were taken and broken and squandered and stolen, misused and abused. When it, it says that when he came back, the father ran to him with open arms. He loved him. He forgave him. And those were things that that man, I mean, they lived longer than we do in, in Bible times, so that man wasn't on his deathbed. Those were things that he probably would have enjoyed, made his life easier, things that he had acquired, acquired. I mean, he, I believe, was wealthy. He had servants, for crying out loud. So <clears throat> when he welcomed his son back, who knows how much longer he lived, but when he finally passed away, I would venture to say that that young man also got part of the, his inheritance again which was probably difficult for the brother, but that's between him and the Lord. But that just shows me how much a father loves his children, the grace that he has given us to forgive us for things. And so I'm thinking of all this story, and I'm thinking, oh, okay. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out where he's going with this. And I'm angry that he has stolen my things and broke my things, and I, I keep... Before I go any further, I'm not saying there's an excuse that we need to let these things go, be taken advantage of, be rug, you know, rugs for people to wipe their feet on. 
um, I'm going to continue to try to minister to my son, try to teach him to be a responsible, respectful, uh, productive person in society. But while I'm going through this, I can still understand my God's heart and try to be Jesus to him so that God can lead him and guide him where he needs to be. And so as I'm thinking of all this, I know through the anger, I mean, I still love him, but I don't like him right now. And I mean, that makes me feel bad. The devil beats me up about that. <clears throat> Jesus. But as I'm thinking of this story and what this father did in the story of the prodigal son, I thought to myself, think about that. You've acquired some things. What is it that you value most? Is it your house? Is it your car? Do you have a vacation home? Is it your money? And I don't want anyone to think that, you know, Dan and I are materialistic or whatever. I know who my source is and where everything that I have comes from. And I pay my tithes. And God gives us the 90% 90, 90 then to we're blessed to be a blessing. So with that 90%, I'm supposed to bless others, not just financially, but with my time, with my knowledge, with my revelation. I'm supposed to share that with others. When God told them to be fruitful and multiply, it wasn't just for procreation. They were supposed to share their fruit, their revelation, what they knew, and so if, I think maybe that's why I have to share too today, because maybe if a couple of you receive the fruit, and then you'll share the fruit, I mean, that's how it multiplies. That's how his glory fills the earth. And so, that's a whole subject on, I mean, a whole nother sermon. <laughs> just how you, we steward what God gives us. But <clears throat> I heard the Lord say, you know, what do you value most? your car, your home, your vacation home, your money, your what is it? Now think about that. Forget about a forget about a stranger taking it and breaking it or stealing it or destroying it. How angry you would become. And as I was thinking about that, as clear as he spoke to me, for God so loved. He loves us so much. He gave the thing that he valued the most. And I, I know that, but I felt that yesterday so much while I was mowing. He wants us to know he loves us so much. Yes, we have things. He wants us to be blessed. He wants to give us good things. But he needs to be our focus. Because when those things become more important than him, we're not, Eric said, you know, when they when they squeeze us, what oozes out? You know, when life and circumstances squeeze us, because life happens, I want Jesus to ooze out. And what is Jesus? Love and grace. That needs to ooze from our very being so that everybody in our life gets to experience Jesus. And when they're wondering, well, I don't know how you're able to get through this. Well, guess what? We're able to get through the things we get through because God loves us so much. That he gave, yes. and he gave, and he gave. Yes. I know that's not like super profound, but it meant so much because it did go from here to here. Yeah. And that's what I call revelation, and I thank God for it today. Yeah. That was a good word. Any prayer requests or testimonies? Sister Mika, have mic. Peter. Yeah, I just want to, you know, I'm just so grateful for the church and everybody that volunteered from on Friday night to spend the next week in the hospital. I mean, I, I even have to drag myself here, even though I love it after I get here. It's, it's just so hard sometimes to come because, you know, Friday we have a lot of meetings and people that want to get stuff done to do things. I've got, I work with a lot of people on the West Coast and obviously for them it's not the way that it is for us. So I've got people that ask me to go with them and do different things. But, you know, this last Friday, 
know, as, as Tammy shared her revelation and Mike was talking now about the vision he had this morning when, when he was awoken, this scripture came to me, to my mind. It's Habakkuk chapter 2, and it says, I will take my stand in my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits his appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Amen. You wrote that revelation in your heart. You went from here to here, like you said. And then all these things that are being revealed right now that are happening here and all this encampments, Mike, as you mentioned, that are starting to, to form in all this area. It's all part of this plan that God has. And, and, and that vision, we have to write it in our heart. And we have to have that assurance that all of those things that he's revealing, they're going to happen. And I'm so glad that we're part of that because this is going to be great when that yes. bubble blows up. Yeah. Anyway, anyone else? Yeah. Go ahead. Anyone else? Yeah, Jody. Yeah.
Anyone else? Yeah, Larry. Yeah. Well, 
Okay, let's stand. <clears throat> let's come to the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you for bringing us here to be gathered in your name. We thank you, Lord, for giving us your word to give us revelation. Revelation, Father, that we can write in the talent of our heart. For we know that your word is true and your word will be fulfilled in our lives and in the lives of others. We thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to go out into this world and spread your message, your message of goodness, of love, of kindness, of peace. Our word, Father, that we share on your behalf so that people come to know and see who you are. We thank you, Father, for giving us your Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, who comforts us in times of need. Whenever we are suffering, we claim to you, Lord. We know that you come to our aid. We know, Father, that you are always with us, that you never abandon us, Lord. We know, Father, that you are always taking care of us, and when we reach out to you, you will always be there, Lord, to do great and wonderful things in our in our lives. Father, we pray that your word transforms and renews our mind and all those negative thoughts that kind of overtake us and anything that the devil throws at us is father we have the tools that you have given us through your word so we can battle those things we ask father that you cover every single person in this room with your holy mantle continue to give us the word lord the the willingness the, the boldness to go out into this world and share with people who you are we are here, Lord, because you have called us to come for a particular purpose that we are to fulfill so that your will is done on this earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father, for giving us the most precious thing that you had, the thing that you valued the most, which was your only son to die for us. That shows, Father, that you love us more than anything. And we thank you for that, and we thank you for that sacrifice. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to change our lives and our hearts and our minds and our spirits so that we can be more like Christ, that we can show people who Christ is and that his light can shine through us so that it shine onto this world, all this darkness that is trying to cover this area is light by your light, Lord. And everything becomes uncovered. We pray for the children, Lord, that are going to school. That you use them as your instruments of peace and love so that they go and share. And when a situation arises, they step into that position of authority that you have given them, Lord, as your children. So that you can act on the life of whatever person they come in contact with. So that they are blessed and also that child is blessed. We thank you, Lord, for giving us all those opportunities to interact with each other. Because we know that... Not only we are blessed, but we also bless the other person as well. Thank you for everything that you do, Father, for giving us many blessings, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your goodness, for being who you are, Lord. You are the Lord, Lord of love. Thank you, Father, for giving us revelation, for giving us vision, for making us who we are in you, Lord. Father, in Jesus'
speak the word this morning. Will you not revive us again? May your people may rejoice in you. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak with new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reviews the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Toby and John, would you mind taking the offering, please? <clears throat> Toby, can you say the blessing, please? Lord, we're thankful to be here today, to be with your people, to give you honor and praise for your worthy. God, as we go through life, we know we are your vessels, God. We carry your treasure inside us that the world cries for. Yes. God, give us boldness to speak it out, God. Yes. In every situation, there is always a word for your glory to be spoken. Yes. God, just give us strength to do your will, Lord, and carry out your Lord, we just ask that you'll bless this offering. Bless the gift and the giver. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
Praise God. Let's give the Lord a big praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike and worship team. Thanks, Tammy and Roberto. Thanks to all of you for sharing your prayer requests and your testimonies. Amen. It's a privilege to be able to come together before the Lord and that wherever two or three are gathered, wherever we can agree on something, God's in the middle of it. Amen. So we know he's here. Woo! Good job, Roberto. Good job. Ginger Baker. I'm going to start calling you Ginger. <laughs> yeah. No, I meant Ginger Baker. Praise God. Let me just read something quickly to you that the Lord just <coughs> called to my attention a moment ago. But in Jeremiah chapter 33, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Then in verse 8 it says, And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me, and I will pardon all their in iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Praise the Lord. Jesus said, this is pro prophesying obviously of Christ, and Jesus said, it is finished. So when the Lord spoke to me a moment ago and said, if you're waiting on me, you're backing up. Yes. Praise the Lord. So this isn't about God coming along and doing something different. The new thing he was going to do is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. He's done it. Now it's finished, and it's time for us then to step out and start working out this salvation that he has produced Amen. in us. Amen. The Jesus that in, is in us is what we're all talking about. But we can wait till hell freezes over and nothing's going to change until we step out in faith. Yes. Right. <laughs> Amen. God is in this world and he's in you. Yes. So it's up to you and I, amen, to stop waiting for God to come along and do something and for us to step out and let God do it through us. I mean, I've been around this for a few years, folks, and uh, we've been waiting on God to do something for a long time. And we're going to be waiting a lot longer until the God in us is allowed to operate the way he intended to operate when he came into us in the first place. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So I'm excited about what God's going to do, but I'm excited because I know he wants to do it through me and he wants to do it through each yes. and every one of you. Praise the Lord. Yes. So we need to get the mindset and the understanding that this is a finished thing. Yes. It's, it's not God's going to do something new. He's already done the new thing, and that new thing is in you, and that new thing wants to get out of you and onto somebody else. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. So let's focus on the Christ that's in us and how he's trying to lead us by his spirit. Yeah. It's not a hard thing. It's not complicated. I had a weird situation. I, I wasn't going to share this because it'll take a little while, but what the heck? We, it's Sunday, right? So, but I had a phone call yesterday, no, Friday morning. And uh, I'd had grandkids all week long, and I had some other, obviously, other responsibilities that I had to take care of. But I had the grandkids because... The older ones are all going back to school, and this is the last chance I really have to just spend one-on-one -on -one with them. I'm talking about the older ones. I had five of them Saturday, or, yeah, Saturday. And, uh, or was it? No, it was Friday. That was Friday. And uh, had three Saturday, yeah, so five on Friday. And two on Tuesday. And I got kind of that same rotation happening next week. Because I want to spend time with them when it's just me and them and not, you know, rushing around, having to do all sorts of stuff, but just be able to spend time together. And we, I do it all the time. And we get together during the school year, too, but it's difficult because, obviously, they have commitments. They're, they're in sports and activities and all the other stuff, too. So this is a chance I get to kind of have that one-on-one -on -one a little bit more than just having a whole bunch of family coming together and try to work it out with them. So anyway, I said that just to let you know what a wonderful human being I am, and then we'll just move on to the rest of this. But so anyway... I get this call. It's like 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's uh, from a jail. Supposedly, this is from a jail in Toledo, Ohio. And it's my grandson. I mean, they didn't say, hey, this is the jail in Toledo, Ohio. Here's your grandson. He wants to talk to you. No, it was my grandson saying, I'm in jail in Toledo, Ohio. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear him. There was so much background clatter and noise and carrying on that I couldn't. 
couldn't really hear him very distinctly, so I had to have him keep repeating himself. But this is the story. <clears throat> he said, uh, Grandpa, this is Max. Now, I'm telling it to you clearly. This isn't the way I heard it. I'm hearing all kinds of gibberish and background noise and hard to distinguish his voice from anybody else's and everything. But he said, uh, I made a big mistake, and I'm embarrassed. I'm humiliated by this, and I want you to promise to not share this with anybody. So I said, without thinking, of course, you got my word. And he said, well, I had a few drinks last night. I came here for a funeral for a friend of mine, Corey. He said, you know Corey. Well, I don't know Corey. I'm from a load of hay. Max lives in Jersey. Him and his mother live in Jersey. So I, don't, I saw him last spring, but that's, I haven't seen him since spring. So. And we don't sit around and chat about his buddies that much. I mean, we talk about a lot of stuff, but not that. So anyway, I said, well, I don't remember Corey, but I said, what's going on? He said, well, anyway, I came to the funeral, and we went out to eat last night after the funeral, and, had, and he said, I'll just be honest with you, I had too much to drink. And I drove, and I got in a wreck. And the cops came, and they did a breathalyzer, and I was de you know, over the limit. And so they put me in jail for DUI and for um, uh, reckless endangerment, because he got hurt and the other person got hurt, according to this. So I said, well, wow, you know, what do you, what do you want? I, I need somebody to bail me out. I said, how much? And he said, well, I don't know. Uh, but he said, my bondsman will call, or not my bondsman, but my, the public defender is going to call you. And he gave me a case number, and he said, the public defender will call you. And... Uh, work it all out and thanks and the, you know the general stuff so okay I hung up and it wasn't a minute later the phone rings and it's this public defender Jimmy Smith if you if, don't hire a lawyer named Jimmy okay just just don't do that yeah anyway Jimmy said what's your relationship to this individual because he asked me the case number and I said well he said what's his name and what's what's your relationship to him because he said it's for security reasons I could, you know I got to know who you are I said well his name is Max Swan and he's my grandson and so then he told me this basically repeated what the guy, other guy had said so I said well you know I mean what are we talking here what I mean how much money are we talking about well he said the bond originally was like 2500 but he said I I got it reduced I got the judge to reduce it but he said the only people that will carry that, the reduced rate, is an international bonding agency. No. So I said, uh, well, now, what are we talking here? He said 1,075. Now, here's what happens. You're working from emotion now. You're not working from intellect. You know, you've got a grandson in jail, and you don't know what's going on, and, you know, you're just concerned about his well-being. And so I said, okay, well, Believe me, we don't have a huge bank account. <laughs> but what we do have is savings because I'm self-employed, so I have to pay my taxes mm -hmm. myself. And rather than pay them quarterly, because I hate giving them anything before I have to give it to them, I pay it at the end of the year. I pay a lump sum, whatever it is, and that's how I pay it out. And I just I bank it as I go through the year. And over the years, I've learned about how much i got to have there to cover what my income is going to be. So that's what I do, so I keep, we, get, we keep money there. And that's all it's for. So I came down and asked Sally, I said, what are we going to do? I said, it's a grandson. I can do whatever we would do for any of the grandchildren. And she said, we'll go get the money out and do what we got to do. So I went to the bank. And I, in the meantime, I'd asked this guy, how am I supposed to get it to you? He said, Western Union. I said, I don't even think Western Union exists anymore. I haven't seen one in years. He said, well, let me check for you. And he comes back and he says, hy V has Western Unions in their branches. And you can, sh you know, you can wire it out through them. So he said, call me back when you get the forms, and I'll tell you how to fill it out. So I'm really troubled about this. I mean, uh, not just because it's my grandson, but I'm having all these emotions going on, and I'm not sure how, what's the Holy Ghost and what's just me being agitated about the whole thing. So I'm praying on the way to Ankeny to the bank, and Sally's praying going the other direction with uh, uh, my youngest daughter and her kids going to do some shopping and stuff. So anyway, I get there. I get the money out, I go to the uh, Western Union, to the courtesy counter, and I get, the co I get the form, and I fill out my part of it, you know, who's sending it. Then I go back to the truck, and I call this guy, Jimmy. <laughs> and I said, uh, what's, all right, who am I sending this to? 
the Dominican Republic. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm happy about Puerto Rico, right? This morning, I'm, I, I got a problem with the Dominican Republic, okay? So, but anyhow, I said, I said, the Dominican Republic, almost that way, and he said, yeah, he said, it's an international bonding agency, and so you get, it, that's where they're closest corp. And I thought, okay, so I'm getting a little antsy, and he's, now he's, he's trying to oversell. He's a lawyer now, and I've had some lawyers yep. in my life. And he said, if we can get him bonded out, Nathan, I promise you we'll get him back to Jersey. He'll have 30 days, come back to court. When he comes back to court, I'll get the charges dropped. I can promise you I'll get the charges dropped, and I'll have his record expunged. Max is like 22, just turned 22. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. This is a lawyer promising me that my... 1500 bucks is about what it was going to come to, all in all, is going to get him totally cleared of all these charges. Now, here's the clinger. He says, so when you go and, and, and have these, this wired, don't tell him what it's about because it may come back on his record. It may come back to haunt him later if there's a record of this having t transpired. So now my sensors are up, you know. I, I you know. I'm not the brightest guy, but I didn't come down with the last shower either. So <laughs> I said, uh, okay, who am I sending this to? And he said, well, the courier for this international bonding company, this is the truth now, the name is Yo Mama something Duran. I said, your mama. <laughs> uh, this is a true story. <laughs> your mama. Well, my mama didn't raise any idiot. <laughs> so I said, uh, I want the number of the police station, and whoever the officer of the day is there, I want to talk to him. Well, now, Jimmy. <laughs> Is a little nervous at this point and goes, uh, well, uh, you know, I'll have to get back with you in a couple of minutes with that. Now, this guy's supposed to be a public defender. He's in that jail every single day. You've got to figure multiple times probably. If he doesn't know the number of that jail, we got a big problem, yeah. and it's worse than Max's. Yeah. So he, I hung up the phone. I tore up the thing from the Western, Western Union. Union. Thank you, Roberta. Were you there? I thought you would have recognized it. Anyway, your mama. So I put, I, uh, I just stuck the 12, you know, 15 or whatever it was in my briefcase and headed back home. And uh, never got another call back from him. Well, I called my daughter, the one I had promised I wouldn't share any information with that I was already disturbed about. So I called her, but she works in the evenings, and so she wasn't, she was in bed asleep and didn't answer the phone. And, so I finally I got, I called her back again about 6 o'clock Friday evening. No, it was later than that because it was after the grandkids left, so it was about 7. I called her back. She has no clue. I said, I, I was kind of being careful about how I brought, broached the subject. You know, I was, well, how's everything going? You know, the job and, you know, how's everything happening there? And you know, the new grandchild, and I was teasing her about being a grandmother now. And, that, and then I just kind of, you know, casually said, how's Max doing? Oh, he's doing great. He's working every day and just busy, busy, busy. And I said, oh, is he right there now? And she said, no, no, he's not here. He's got his own place. You know that. And I said, no, I mean, is he there in Jersey? Sure. She said, he's, he'll, he'll be over here tomorrow. In fact, he's going to call you tomorrow because his birthday had just gone by. So uh, I said, okay. And then I told her what the deal was. And she just, of course, she freaked out and flipped up and was insane. Then I talked to my grandson yesterday on the way to the <laughs> anniversary deal he calls and I'm talking to him and I had to redo the whole thing to him and he was just completely freaked out about the whole thing too but so nevertheless what I'm saying is everything's not what it appears praise God <laughs> and uh, you know if it hadn't been for the Holy Spirit I probably wouldn't have asked the questions I asked because I was already in an, in an emotional state I was angry but I was also concerned about my grandson and I thought just whatever it takes to get him out of there and get this thing kind of sorted out 
where it makes some sense. And, uh, but I, I mean, I'm saying we don't, we don't realize. I mean, we're talking about prophetic words and so on and so forth. I, I'm telling you, and you can, whatever this you can accept, fine. What you can't accept, you'll have to just deal without it. But you already have the spirit of prophecy in you. Yeah. You need no one to teach you how to prophesy. No. You just need, that when you open your mouth, if you're in agreement with the word of God, you can speak prophetic utterances anytime, anywhere, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You don't need to go to a prophetic conference or school to be a prophet. We are all prophets. Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. Now, he wouldn't have said that he, he would like us all to prophesy if we didn't have the capacity to prophesy. So we have the Holy Spirit in us to lead us and to guide us into all truth. I was, you know, basically uh, minutes away from throwing away 1500 bucks that I didn't have. Amen. But God is my banker. Right. Hallelujah. And my lawyer. Amen. Amen. My advocate. Yes. And therefore, he's my grandson's advocate. Amen. We just need to learn to trust in the Lord. And, and also, don't trust so much in people because there's some crooked people out there. Jimmy, I'm talking about. <laughs> Praise God. And I'm saying that because if you haven't ever seen Call Saul... Y'all call Saul, you, you know, have you, anybody ever seen that series? Well, that's Jimmy I'm talking about, Slick Jimmy. Slippin' Jimmy, the slippery Jimmy, I don't know, but he was, anyway. Praise the Lord. So I had a kind of a busy Friday as well, praise God. I hope you can understand why I wasn't here. I was dealing with a major international crisis. So... How do you like me now? Praise the Lord. Anyway, praise God. What but the point of that was, I don't know, other than to have some sympathy before I begin this message. Praise God. I'm still dealing with a little stress, but I, God is my keeper. Hallelujah. Well, I, how many of you have watched the Olympics? Praise the Lord, though, for Puerto Rico. I'm really happy for them. They deserve a, they deserve a gold medal. Amen. Speaking of tennis, did you see the gal? that was in the middle of the court in the tennis match. Her, did, yeah, did you see her name? The, the one that was in the middle of the court. Annette. Are you guys pretty tough this morning? I love the Olympics. Praise God. Annette, She's right there in the middle of the court. So I've had a busy week and uh, looking forward to another one next week. Y'all keep track of the Olympics for me because I'm busy dealing with international issues that are way beyond this. Praise God. Dominican Republic, your mama. I mean, I, I, it was a pretty cool scam until then. I mean, you would have thought they could have come up with something better than your mama Duran in the Dominican Republic. If, if they just said Canada, you know what I mean? Or any, any place else, you know, Brazil maybe even, but the Dominican Republic just doesn't ring like true, especially coming from lawyer Jimmy. I'm only, you know, aggravated because I was so stupid to even, you know, I didn't know I couldn't understand his voice. I couldn't hear his voice, you know. It's, I can't tell. And then they basically, they were just sucking information out of me. What's your relationship to this guy, you know? Well, what's his name? I, guess I gave them everything they needed, you know, to scam me, basically. So, but thank the Lord. Amen. Smarter than all my scammers because of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it has. I, my son later... Uh, Tony, he checked it out on the internet. He, in fact, he told me, Dad, that, that scam was going around about a year ago. He said, I'm sure that's what it is. And then he Googled up something and called me back later and said, yeah, that's exactly, that's their MO. You know, it's the, all the background noise so you can't hear who they are. Right. And they call a grandparent because they know that they don't have as intimate a uh, relationship usually 
So you wouldn't know necessarily where they are, you know, if they've gone out of town or done something, especially for a 22 year old. I mean, they're out doing their thing too. So anyway, that, that's what it was and thank the Lord. Oh, sorry, wrong number. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy, but that's what happens. They get you in an emotional state to where you're not thinking rationally. You're just thinking, well, it's my grandkid. You know, what am I going to do? And so they get you to, to do things without thinking, really. But again, like I said, praise the Lord. Yeah. Happy that it's, everything's cool in, in Jersey and, yeah. and everything's yeah. fine with my bank account as soon as Sally gets that 1200 back over to Ankeny. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. All right. Let's get to the Word of God. I've covered enough personal territory already. Uh, let's go to Mark uh, chapter 8. And I want to read verses 34 through 37. Praise the Lord. Now, thank you. I guess, you know, I, I prefaced what I was saying about, uh, by saying that God is already finished. So what God's going to do is going to be done through us. And one of the biggest challenges for us, as we've already heard this morning, is to believe that God will use us. Well, he's already, he's already devoted everything to that, <coughs> to that end, you know, to that purpose. So what the devil has to do is to keep you in a, in a condition or a state of uncertainty about your condition and your relationship with God. Because once you are secure in that finished work, nothing can stop you. No devil in hell. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. But we, you know, we've got to have a solid, sure foundation in the finished work of God to overcome this flesh, to overcome the thing that's going to try to stop you from doing all the things that, you're, that you've been qualified to do, that you've been empowered to do by the Holy Spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? So when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So if we're, if we're really going to uh, deny ourselves, then we need to be preoccupied and consumed with someone other than ourselves. Amen. Praise the Lord. Focus of religion, believe it or not, is really on you. What have you done for me lately? You know, what are you doing to make yourself more acceptable? What are you doing to, to comply or conform to the rules and the, and the uh, you know, the, the conditions? Amen. But look what Jesus said. If you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Right? Call the people together. He said, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The thing that stands out to me is me. Yeah. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So the thing is like bookend. It's, it's, the focus is on him and not on us. Praise the Lord. Take up your, he says, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The deny yourself starts and ends with me, with the word me, right? It's framed by the focus being on Christ and not on you. Amen? So in other words, if we want the abundant life, that's the life of Jesus, that's Christ in you, the hope of glory, then we need to stop thinking and obsessing and focusing on ourselves and focus on Jesus and his love for us. Yes. Praise the Lord. We can, we can get so hung up on us that we forget that we no longer live. That's right. But it's Christ who lives in us. Right. Yes. Nevertheless, I live, but yet it's not me. It's Christ in me. Right. 
Praise the Lord. So when we become preoccupied with Jesus, we lose our lives, but we actually find them. Yes. It's what Paul's talking about when he says, I'm dead, but nevertheless I live. It's a paradox. It's a, you know, it's a contradiction in some ways. Amen? We lose our lives when we focus on Jesus, when we focus on his love for us, who he is, and what he's already done for us. Because his story is our story. Jesus took up his cross and the reason he was able to take up his cross is because he trusted totally in God. He trusted in the promise, all the Old Testament prophecies, all that had gone before. He trusted in that. That's how he was able to take up his cross. That's how he was able to go to the cross. That's how he was able to carry his cross with the help of, a, of another at one point. Amen? Look at Mark. Look at this again. Mark 8. We'll just read verses 34 and 35, Sheila. Oh, well, thank you. I'm sorry to do that. It's a miracle. When he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, look at, look at the words, okay? He called the people, the disciples. He said to them, Whoever's going to come after me, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. Amen. So Jesus has given us an invitation, and it's an invitation to life. Amen. The invitation is to really live, not just exist, not just sucking air and blowing air. He's talking about really being alive, the, the kind of life that most of us aspire to and want to have and, and see in the scripture, but don't actually walk out. And that's the life that he's inviting us to. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. The invitation is to really live, not just exist, not just to breathe, but to live life as it was meant to be lived, the, what we, the way we were created to live. Amen? Amen. But his invitation to this life is, as I said, paradoxical because God's invitation to life comes through death. Praise God. Now, sometimes we think that... Uh, Jesus is telling us that following him means humiliation, right. it means pain, it means suffering. It means, you know, really being, you know, taken advantage of. It means we won't be happy. Like this life is, you know, it's just suffering. But at least we'll be happy when we die and go to heaven. Now, I'm not naive, and I realize life can be difficult. There's hard times, there's, there's issues, there's, there's obstacles, there's problems, tribulations. But Jesus isn't saying, follow me and your life is going to be miserable. He isn't saying, follow me into this horrible routine of life. Amen. Look at Matthew chapter 11, chapter 28, or excuse me, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Mm -hmm. The life he wants to give you is a life of rest. It's not a life of struggle and strife and anxiety and, and stress and can I do it? May, will I be able to do it? Is it possible to do it? No. He's saying if you'll, if you'll really come to me, you can relax because you are dead. Your life is hid in me. I am your life. And I know how to live it. Because I've already seen it before the foundation. He was there before. He's, he's there at the end. He's there everywhere. Amen. John 10.10. 10. Abundant life. John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, but I have come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. The life Jesus wants you to have is an abundant life. It's not just a life of eking out a, a, a survival. It's not just getting by. It's not just gritting your teeth and, and figuring out, if I can just get through this mess, you know, things will get a little better. No, the life he wants to give us is the life that is abundant, a, yes. more abundantly. I want to give them life that is a life of peace, a life of joy, a life of, uh, of, 
of your needs being met, of your issues being resolved, of your situations, if they're not done away with, the strength to walk through it. So that it isn't a heaven and hell crisis, uh, you know, a, a life or death thing every single time something happens. We access that abundant life by giving up control. Woo! Nobody likes to give up control. We're all control freaks. We're human beings. That's what humans are. They want to be in control. Have you ever noticed when you give people control, they take it? If you give somebody authority over you, they'll exercise it. It won't be long. I mean, maybe not at first, but it won't be long. They'll start exercising that authority. And then you'll get mad because they're interfering in your personal stuff. <laughs> you gave it to them. Praise God. The only person I want to yield control to is Jesus. And possibly my wife at times. <laughs> the Lord. Because Jesus is in her, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right, back to Mark chapter 8, if you will, Mike, 34 and 35. When he had called the people unto him whom his disciples and his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now, a lot of times we read that and we say, okay, you've got to be martyred for Jesus. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if you'll yield it to me and to the truth of God's word, yes. you'll have a life that you never dreamed possible. Yes. That's the abundant life he's trying to get to us. But we have to yield control of our lower life in order to achieve Amen. the truth of his life dwelling in us and operating through us. So the point of the scripture isn't what we do for Jesus. It's what he does for us when we trust him completely. Right. Amen? It's not, you can't do this halfway. No. So it's not about our heroic self-denial. It's about Jesus leading us into life. The Holy Spirit was given to lead us and to guide us into all truth. The truth of what your real life is. The reality of what this life is supposed to be. Only the Holy Spirit can lead you to it. It's the Spirit of Christ. It's the Spirit of God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We follow him because he's the source of life. Yeah. Yeah. He's not just like a you know the icing on the life cake. He's the cake. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He's the oven that bakes the cake. Yeah. He's everything. He's, all, he's it from beginning to end. Alpha Omega. Amen. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't say my cross. He says your cross. It's even more interesting. He doesn't say die on your cross. He says just take your cross or carry your cross. We don't die on our cross because Jesus already died on his cross for us. Yes. Our cross is this. It's about trusting him. It's about giving up control. Praise God. He carried his cross. He died on it so that we could truly be free. It's about identifying with his death and resurrection. That's the cross that we carry. It's about the source of abundant life. It's about the source of a satisfying life. It's about the source of true life. Right. Let me show you. Uh, we'll just go a little bit further with this then. All right. Look, let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. But can you see how every scripture in here, taken out of the context of grace and the goodness of God and the love of God and the God's, God's desire for us to be more than conquerors. If you take it out of that context, you'll be scattered from hither to yon trying to figure out what Scripture's talking about. If you can find the kind of like the, the key, which is God's goodness and God's grace and God's mercy and God's love, then you can find the context for Scripture. 
Outside of that, it's a crapshoot every time you read a scripture. You don't know what the actual context may be, even if you read before and after. Because if you come in with the wrong premise, you're going to come up with the wrong answer. Amen. So I know what I work. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. How many of you really want to say hallelujah, praise the Lord to that? Has anybody here ever been lukewarm? I mean, not really hot, but not really just cold, but just kind of, I'm just on, I mean, I'm just here still, you know? Well, damnation's right around the corner, praise God. Anybody want to shout over that? Want feel like dancing in the spirit or anything? Anyone? Okay, praise the Lord. We'll move on. Generally, we've been told if Christians become lukewarm or mediocre, then you're in danger of being damned and separated from God. But what happens is really the result often arrived at by reading things out of context, by taking scripture out of context. Let me show you again. That was Laodicea, right? That was just one type of church, right? Okay, so Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. This is the church in Sardis. Another type, okay? And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, but you're dead. Know your works. And then the Lord tells what those works are. You have a reputation for being alive. Truth is, you're dead. So the words to both churches, Laodicea and Sardis, weren't about poor behavior. But they're, 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 it's about their performance. Formed work being self-righteous. Having this self-righteous exterior and an empty interior. Yeah. You claim to be alive. You've got a reputation for being alive. You're dead. And the words to both of those churches were not about poor behavior. They were about works that they were performing with a righteous exterior and an empty interior. They may have been well motivated, but the problem was they weren't being led by the Spirit. They were just doing stuff. I mean, it's good to give, to help, to do things for other people. But you know, horrible people do stuff like that. doesn't make them saved. doesn't make them being led by the Spirit. Sometimes it's just a guilty conscience. But God wants to direct our steps. He wants to live his life through us. He says your works make you look alive on the outside, but inside you're really dead. Your works may fool somebody else, but they aren't fooling me. And this concept of works being defined as lukewarm or mediocre or even evil works is simply not true because that's not what he's talking about the issue wasn't that believers were lukewarm their their supposedly Christian works came from self-righteousness you can feed the hungry from now and forever if it's just because you want to get the Nobel Prize or have, you know, be the nicest guy on the block and have everybody say, gee, what a wonderful bunch of people down there. Those are, those, those are Christians. I'm not saying you shouldn't feed the hungry. I'm saying unless we're doing it, being led by the Spirit, it's still dead. It's self-righteousness. It's not God working through us. They approach God with a mixture of law and and grace. These are saved churches. This is the book of Revelation. These are people that are born again. So don't say, don't think that it can't happen because it's happened and he's trying to tell us it can happen to you. So they approach God with this mixture of law and grace thinking their good behavior would keep them in good stead with God. And that now God owes me blessing. 
He's got to heal me now. He's got to prosper me now. He's got to do this. He's got to do that because I'm good. I'm doing good stuff. But their hearts were far from him. And I'm not talking about a warm, fuzzy feeling here. I'm talking about your life source. Not the blood pump. I'm talking about the Jesus that gives you life. We already talked about it, right? Life isn't breathing and pumping blood through our veins. Life is the life of Christ living through us. Look at Isaiah 29. And verse 13. I'm, I'm not mad at anybody except Jimmy. <laughs> and I don't even know where he is. <coughs> oh, by the way, I called him yesterday, didn't I, Sal? Just before we left to go to the... Yeah. And guess what? The idiot answered. <laughs> I swear to God. I still got the number. And... I call, and, and it wasn't Jimmy, but it was somebody else, some other phony. And they always say, legal aid, legal aid. I said, oh, really? Could I speak to Jimmy? Oh, Jimmy's not in his office today. I, he said, is there anything I could help you with? And I said, I'd like you to get this message to Jimmy. My grandson's not in jail. He said, oh, did they release him? I said, no, he was never in jail, you idiot. <laughs> Click. It went really dead on the other end at that point. And I dialed it three or four times after that, and they never did pick up after that. Apparently, they got the idea that, oh, that's that number we were calling yesterday. Yeah. 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 Jimmy's not in his office yesterday. He was probably on a flight to the Dominican Republic to pick up a check that isn't there. Yeah. I'm hoping, praise the Lord. Okay, so wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. Yeah. In other words, the fear isn't an awesome wonder. It's, oh my God, here comes the Lord again. Yeah. Where did that come from? Precept of men. Yeah. Not from the word of God, not from God himself, but from some distorted translation or interpretation and understanding of God. Praise the Lord. All right, look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. It's basically a, a paraphrasing of this same scripture. This people draw nigh with, uh, unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I'm not the source for their life. They talk about me. They even preach me. But I'm not pumping life through them. They're not being led by my spirit. They're not, they're not enjoying. Now, I'm not saying they're going to hell. He didn't say they were going to hell. He just said they're not getting the benefit of abundant life. They're just sucking air. They're just at the very lowest level of this experience. Yes. They're born again, but they're going to have to die to get anything out of this. And that wasn't my intention. My intention was that they die to themselves so that I can live through them. Praise God. And that's why the Lord says, I wish you were one or the other. Right. And I can understand why God would want Christians to be hot, a.k.a. on fire. <laughs> right? Yeah. But why would God want some Christians to be cold? That gives me chills, praise the Lord. But what the Lord is actually saying is, I wish you'd adopt either law or grace. But because you're mixing them, I can have nothing to do with you. Because living with mixture of both will never lead you to God. The law can lead you to God. It can bring you to the end of yourself. If it's preached the way it's supposed to be preached, not as though it's something you can do, but something that it's impossible for you to do, so you'll finally get to the place where you'll say, oh, woe is me. I need a Savior. Right. Ah, and here comes grace. <laughs> with the life of God to flow through you and to give you that life, that abundant life. Yes. 
These people were hanging on the boat. And I'm telling you, churches are filled today with the same problem. And don't tell me it's not, or he wouldn't have written it. There wouldn't have been any need for it. It's there for our benefit. They already had the problem. He, we didn't need to keep the letter. They could have read it once and thrown it away. Grace is hot. Amen. Amen. It's light. The law is cold. It's distance. It doesn't bring you closer to God. It makes you more aware of your distance from God. The law will lead you to grace. Because it will bring you to the place where you realize, finally, I cannot fulfill the law. I need somebody, an intermediary. I need an advocate. I need somebody, a substitution. I need something. Like Job said, oh, that there were someone who could stand between me and God. Someone who'd get between me and God's anger at my humanity. Yes. Thank God he's come. Yes. And he finished the work yes. so that we could have this abundant life. Yes. Praise God. All right. He says he would rather those in the church be one or the other. Hot, totally accepting of God's grace and dependent on it, or cold, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how you're going to overcome the next obstacle, believing that God's the one throwing them in your path. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. Somebody say, my name is Jimmy. Jimmy. And I'll take all you give me. Praise the Lord. I know thy works that thou art. Okay. We already know that. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. <laughs> That's worth repeating. Because you say, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The issue was not mediocrity. The issue was not lukewarmness, but the issue was self-reliance. The issue we still have today, the issue we still struggle with, the issue that actually keeps us, holds us back from abundant life. Yes. You, like I said, you can accept it or not. You can believe it now or you can believe it later. I, I promise you later you're going to believe it yes. if it takes you until you get to heaven to know all things. Right. Might as well get on board now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Because I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, that sent some of you into a deep <laughs> despair right there, didn't you? I'm just saying. I know so much, I just, I know how to read. It's like a guy told me one time, sitting in the doctor's office, years ago I was working in a steel mill. And uh, I was reading through the magazines because I'm bored to death and don't even want to be there in the first place, but I got to be there. So I'm reading through the magazines. And he said, you know, I noticed something about you. He said, you, you're pretty smart, aren't you? I said, what, what makes you say that? He said, because you reads. <laughs> Swear to God. Same one that told me he, about a restaurant. I said, where is it? He said, it's out there in Eubendale or Clyde. <laughs> I went out of there feeling like really, really smart. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, so if anybody... Has a problem with it, I can show you where Eubendale and Clive are both out west. I know that because I read maps. Yeah. Praise <laughs> God. Okay, verse 20. Yes. Just trying to. Don't get too intense here. Praise the Lord. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Same offers given to us. See him as he is. Loving God. Full of grace. Full of truth. Or to continue holding on to doctrines of convenience. The precepts of men. Self-righteousness. Maintaining a false image of God and his expectation of us. Just remember... Everything we do is being observed by somebody. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. 
We're talking about winning people to Jesus. Do you want to really win them to Jesus, or do you want to win them to some idol, some false image, some hocus pocus? I don't know. This might rub some people the wrong way, but you know what I said about the cat? Turn it around, praise the Lord, because I'm going to keep rubbing the same direction. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to take away anybody's rice bowl here. I'm just saying we, we, have, we have made issues over things that are not issues. You are miraculous. You have supernatural power. You have the God of glory, the creator of the universe dwelling in you. Nothing, amen, was impossible for you. But you don't have to be weird to do it. You need to be like Jesus, and you just flow through your life touching the lives of the people that come into contact with you because it's all a plan. It's all a setup. There are no accidents. There's no coincidences. Not for Christians, not for believers. There's not good luck and bad luck for us. There's the truth of God's word and his life flowing through us. It's our choice to follow religion or follow Jesus. And you know, a, a dressed up, newer version of religion is still religion. Right. Just because it's 21st century religion doesn't make it any different than the first century religion. It's still religion. It's still a, it's still a mixture of me and God. And it will not fly. All right, Revelation 1 and 8. Again, I'm not mad. I'm just saying, I'm telling you some stuff that I learned over a long time. Yes. Now, I may not be as charismatic as some, and I'm not against charisma or, and charismatic acts. I'm all for the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. But I'm telling you, I want the gifts of the Spirit, not your interpretation through your flesh. I want the real deal, and that's what the world wants, and they can see a phony as soon as they look it in the face, yes. even if we think it's real. I want them to come in and receive from God in the midst of God's people. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Amen. And if it doesn't happen here, it can happen to you at Walmart. It can happen to you just like you, Doug. You think you failed? You didn't fail. You did the one thing God asked you to do. It's not in your hands anymore. You just do what the Lord leads you to do. You're a success. You're victorious. As far as heaven's concerned, you did what God asked you to do. The man doesn't want it. The man doesn't have to have it. But you gave him, you offered him Jesus, and he said, no thanks. He'll get more offers, I promise you. It's not the will of God that any should perish. But he'll still have to be the one to make the decision. And I guarantee you what you did is much better than drag, you know, stuffing a track in his hand and trying to get him to believe in your kind of baptism or your particular doctrine, uh, you know, the, the Roman road or whatever, whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not against any of those things. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying that's all gibberish to them. They need life. And the only life they can have that's going to change their life is the life of God. And you're the only one that can give it to them. Yeah. Say, well, I got problems. Join the human race. Praise God. <laughs> but the problems will not stop God from operating through us if we'll give him the freedom to do it. Amen. I'm Alpha and Omega. Beginning and ending, saith the Lord which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Yes. Now, there's a simplicity in grace that I love. And it's the same simplicity that there is in Jesus. A, a little kid can be born again. Yes. A 99-year-old man or woman can be born again. Yes. It's not complicated. Yes. He is first. He is in control. He loves us. And he has a plan. And a future for us. Yes. It's not that we have to make him first. He is first. You can't make him first. You can't make him last or second or somewhere in between. He is first. And his firstness has always been. Yes. He was already first before you got here. Yes. He'll always be first even after we're gone. Yes. He'll still be first. It's not that we have to make him first. He is. Yes. 
He's God all by himself. He doesn't even need me to acknowledge him for him to be God. Jesus is God in the flesh. The exact image of God. The spirit that's in you. The spirit of Christ that dwelleth in you. It is the spirit of God. The same spirit that was in Christ when he was a man on this planet. That's why you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily as well. As it was in Christ. So the implication here is of Jesus being first is that Jesus is more. What was that? I mean, I'm just saying, if you're first, that means you're more than somebody else. If you come in first in a race, what happened? You had more speed than the one behind you, right? If, if you, you know, whatever, first always is an implication, at least, that that first is more than second, third, fourth, whatever it is. So it's saying he's more. Jesus is more than your sickness. He's more than sin. He's more than tragedies. He's more than disasters. He's more than your problems. Whatever you're facing, he's more. Yes. Amen. Jesus is more than Moses. Uh-huh. A greater than Moses. Yep. Moses was the epitome of the law. Yep. Jesus is the epitome of grace. Yep. Yes. He's more than Moses. Yep. A greater than Moses. Yep. He is the fulfillment of the law. Yes. Moses brought something that nobody could do. And dangle it out there like it was something where there was potential for us to achieve. Jesus came and fulfilled that demand. So that we literally have the potential that we could have never achieved in any other way. He fulfilled the law. We didn't. In Matthew 11, we read it earlier, Jesus says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out? Are you fed up? Get away with me. Do you like pina coladas? (laughs) Get caught in the rain. Are you into health food? Or just champagne? Come with me and escape. I know that's really stretching here, but come on. That's what he's saying. He said, come away with me. I'll give you, I'll give, you know, the song is about a guy and a gal that just kind of lost their first love. And they're both looking to regain it. And they find it where it always was. They just had to be awakened yes. to it. Yes. And that's what Jesus is saying. Come with me. Come away with me. Yes. Yeah. I'll, sh- I'll give you rest. Yeah. I'll give you the peace. I'll give you the more that you can never get on your own. I'll give you the love that you look for everywhere, but only I can satisfy. Deny yourself. Carry your cross. And you recover life. Walk with me. Keep company with me. You'll learn to live freely. And I'll show you real rest. God is real. And he wants you to find life. Say, how? By losing yourself in him. By losing yourself in his love. His goodness. His grace. By losing yourself in the goodness of what he's done for you. In the finished work. And when we find ourselves in that. Come unto me. You know I just see it. I know it's not geographic. but Or physical. physical, But I see it like this. When I find myself in that space. That space is Jesus. When I find myself in that space. I discover (coughs) what life really is. That's what we're talking about when we say I'm mowing the grass and all of a sudden things that have troubled me for two years seem to not be as big a deal anymore. Not that they went away. It's not that they don't still exist. But all of a sudden my life is defined by something more than that problem. 
more than that individual, more than that situation. My life is defined by the love of God, by the goodness of God. And let me tell you something, church. That's what this world is crying out for, and they don't even know it. And the problem is the church hasn't known what to give them because we didn't know it either. But we're living in a time when God is revealing to us his purpose in a way, in a more defined way than ever before, in a way that we can comprehend. Call it revelation. Call it what you want. I don't care what we, how, what we call it. I just want to experience it. Yes. And so does God. Amen. He has given us this life yes. to free us from what we thought was life, but was actually just a slow death. Yes. Yes. Amen. Trust in his love and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. Yes. Now you've got something to offer. Yes. And it's not hype. It doesn't have to be built up. It doesn't have to have a, a ham and organ playing in the background. It can happen at Walmart with kids screaming and hollering and somebody wiping their nose on your shirt sleeve. And it can happen anywhere yep. if you're aware of this life and this love that's flowing through you. Mm -hmm. Amen. And let me remind you of this. A river can't pass through anywhere without getting it wet. That anointing, that love cannot flow through you without affecting you. Personally. That's why he says you are blessed to be a blessing. And the more you bless, the more blessed you get in the process. Because it all points back to him. Not me, not my ministry, not you, not your particular interpretation, but to God. The father and husband of us all. Amen. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. So I'm saying just relax. And believe God and watch miracles happen. Because in the, in the kingdom, miracles are normal. Yeah. Miracles are natural. They're only supernatural when we're in the flesh. Right. Praise, God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Go in the love of God. Have a great week. Amen. Enjoy the spirit of God, the life of God that flows in you.